Hello there, you're welcome to Biology Video Lectures with Akirili Oladimiji Philip. It's my um, joy to have you with me on the lecture today. So the, today we'll be starting off um, a series on um, UTME past questions. So I will be starting with, off with this particular year. So we going to be by year, like each of the years. So I will advise you to get a note and a pen because I'm going to be saying, saying a lot of things that are not, I mean, exactly with the questions. I will deliberately sometimes go ahead to talk about some topics on purpose for the sake of revision, just to make sure that I bring you to page for each of your desired um, score for your UTME. All right, so let's get started. Now, the question one here says, which of the following characterize a mature plant cell. Now, it says here, the nucleus is pushed to the center of the cell. That's off. The, the, the nucleus in a plant cells are not at the center, so that is not. The cell was made up of cellulose. That made sense. Now, the nucleus is small and irregular in shape. That doesn't apply really. We don't know that. Cytoplasm fills the entire cell space. Well, that is common to all cells, so to say. So it's not specific, really. So the point is, um, the um, cytoplasm filling up the entire space, cell space doesn't really talk about something so specific to plants. But saying the cell wall is made up of cellulose, that made sense. I think this word mature plant cell is not much of an issue here in this respect, really. So the answer to that is going to be B. All right. Now, this is what we're trying to say. I'm going to look at what I just talk, talked about here. The cell, sorry, the nucleus is by the side for plant cell and the nucleus is at the middle for animal cell. So when the question was saying that um, the, the nucleus is pushed to the center of the cell, well, that does not apply. All right. So basically, you might want to pause the video here to probably look at this the more like I told you. So this is a plant cell that has cell wall, which is made up of cellulose, a type of polysaccharide. All right. Now, which of the following is not a function of the nucleus of a cell? I always advise students to do this. Try to eliminate out the ones you know cannot just be the answer. The ones that are closely related, you can think more on that. This is here. He translates genetic material for the manufacture of protein that made sense to some extent let me just put that on a whole like that it stores and carries hereditary material it's okay it's not function of the nucleus okay now it stores and carries hereditary material well that is part of the function of the nucleus it is a reservoir of energy for cell well the the organelle that does that is the mitochondria plural mitochondria so let's put that that doesn't look like a nuclear function so i'm going to put that there it controls all cells all um controls the life processes of the cell the nucleus is regarded as the brain of the cell because it controls every activity within the cell now this is part of the function this part of the function this is also part of the function indirectly. Now, translation, which is part of um, gene expression in genetics, takes place in the ribosome, which is in the cytoplasm. However, the information with which translation will take place came also from the instruction on the DNA. If you have seen my lecture on genetics, probably to make more sense to you. So, there's a stage called transcription which is taking place in the nucleus which is photocopying of the one of the strands of dna to form mrna and translation is taking place in the cytoplasm within the ribosome which is done by mrna basically and ribosome rna and all of that so we mean well, what it means that so this three has to do with function of the nucleus directly or indirectly but the reserve of energy is the mitochondria so the answer to this question is c all right now, the dominant phase life cycle of, of a fern is actually the uh, sporophyte. 
Now, let me show you what that means. Now, looking at this, um, there's something called alternation of generation, which whereby um, a diploid phase alternates with an haploid phase. And the haploid phase, I mean, that means it is just having half set of the chromosomes is basically, and the diploid phase is having two sets of chromosomes, basically. So what you're seeing here is the um, haploid phase of um, fern, and uh, or you can say the pteridophyte, so to say, and this is the sporophyte phase, which is the um, the matured phase. Now, when you say something is dominant, it means that that phase is more obvious. Not only is it more obvious, it is the phase whereby you get to um, that has the major structure. It stays longer. It's not short lived. Yes, two things. It is major structure. It stays longer. It's not short lived. That's what what it means to be um the dominant phase or like bryophyte that the the dominant phase is the gametophyte basically if you have seen my lecture also on taxonomy this will make sense to you the more all right however this is okay for you to answer this question mm -hmm. now parental care is exhibited in what snails no i'm not sure i've ever seen a place whereby mother snail is taking care of the the small ones earthworms no birds that makes sense but let's look at d toads no bobros have give parental care yes you can even look at your poultry i mean your hen when it has its cheeks it has its around it not only hen now even birds i mean in their nest on the tree still take care of they are chicks or they are young ones. So they exhibit parental care. All right. Now, let me see at this point, please. You are expected to actually pause the video. Pause the video. Attempt the question first and see if you can get the answer. If you can't, then you play the video to hear what I'm going to say. That's what you should do for each of the questions. It's going to help you to see how much of this you already know or not. And afterwards, when you hear the explanation, you probably get to have, learn more things. Which of the following groups of cells is devoid of true nucleus? Well, organisms true of nucleus true, true nucleus are called prokaryotes. Prokaryotes. Or we say pro prokaryotic cell. One of the ones that have true nucleus are called eukaryotes. Now, let me quickly see at this point. The prokaryotes in example of prokaryotes actually what bacteria which belongs to kingdom monera which means you don't have a true nucleus you have a well-defined nucleus so looking at this now I'm going, you're going to get the answer by yourself now and eukaryotes are the ones that have true nucleus example includes the um protist includes the fungi or fungi includes the plant plantae includes the animals animalia so these four kingdoms basically have true nucleus and they are called eukaryotes. So looking at what we have on the screen, algae apparently belongs to the plant kingdom. We have um, filamentous algae or even unicellular. Those algae are within either plants or protists. Basically, we have filamentous algae, which can be plants. So don't be confused that why is he saying that algae can be. We have filamentous algae, which is where as a plant. I have some algae that are also protists. So either way, they are prokaryotes. So eukaryotes. Then we have monera, which is our answer. Fungi is already here. Virus does not belong to any of the kingdoms of living things because it exhibits both um, living and non-living entities. So we regard virus. So virus does not even fall in any of this, really. So the answer is Monera. Hope that is clear. So I, I added this picture to make it easier for you to understand. At this point, you might want to pause the video to make it easier for you. Now, looking at this, now you see the prokaryote here. This is a bacterium cell, singular. Bacterium. That doesn't have a true nucleus. Looking at that, where it has, this is genetic material. That is not surrounded by anything. Now we call that region. We are preparing for UTME, so you should know something like this. The region where the genetic material is found in prokaryotes is called nucleoid, nucleoid zone, or just nucleoid for short. All right. So 
when somebody asks you what is nucleoid, nucleoid is the area where the genetic material in prokaryotes are found. However, they don't have a true nucleus. While on the other hand, pro sorry, eukaryotes now have a true nucleus. You can see that. So the genetic material is within this sensed place. So you can say it doesn't have a true nucleus, it doesn't have a well-defined nucleus. It means the same thing as prokaryotes. All right, so the answer remains Monera. Sorry, I'm trying to get this off. Now, which of the following is true of the transverse section of a dicot stem? Mm. Now, I would advise you, you try to probably get some of my other lectures on some of those things that, why I'm saying that is because I may not be able to explain explicitly, explicitly on some of those things, but however, I will try my best here. Mm. Now, of course, this is a rough, um, what's called skeletal kind of crash program to quickly help you. It's going to really help you, that I'm sure of. But probably you want a big, basic, um, rooted understanding of some of those things. You might want to get some of the lectures on each of the topics. Now, which of these is true of the travel section of dicot system? Now, the xylem is more interiorly located than the phlegm. That is not really a factor. It's, it's not really different, really. Yeah. The cambium lies between the cortex and the vascular, between, sorry, the cambium lies between the cortex and the vascular bundle. Yeah, that made sense. Let me put a star there. Yeah. Now, the vascular bundle are randomly scattered within the cortex. Well, that is actually for uh, um, monocots. So it has, that doesn't even apply to dicot in any way. The problem is completely encycled by cortex. Well, that is false, really. The epidermis is outside in the stem. And for um, the root, it is peripheral layer. So that doesn't really apply. So the answer to this question is cambium is between the cortex and vascular bundles. Let me show you what that means in a minute. Looking at this, really, this is the cortex. You can see that this, this entire region is the cortex. Now, looking at this, look at the cambium. Now, see the cambium. This whitish part is the cambium. So, the vascular body is formed by two things, phlegm and xylem. So, your cambium is found between the xylem, sorry, between the phlegm and the xylem and within the vascular bundle. Sorry, within and the cortex. Let me take that again. The vascular bundle is made up of phlegm and xylem, correct? And this is the cortex. So, this is the the cambium in between this is the vascular bundle, vascular bundle, and the cortex. It's there. It's in the, It's between the two vascular bundles, so to say, and that is within the cortex. So that is the only reasonable answer in this question, which is option B. All right. Moving on. Which of the following is lacking in the diet of a person with kwashiorkor? Kwashiorkor is um, a disease mostly found in children and it happens when you don't have enough proteins mm. now there's something that accompanies kwashiorkor which is them having pot belly or this solemn belly it is most times because if you don't have enough protein in your system your filtering capacity i mean the function there's some proteins that helps our kidney to work and those proteins are made in the liver so when you don't have enough proteins something goes wrong with those with a filtering capacity and fluid accumulates around the liver. That's why they tend to have pot belly this way. All right. Now, the mode of nutrition of sun dew and bladder wort can be described as what? Saprophytic? No, that has to do with something decaying. Holozoic is in animals that get to swallow things. All right. Then chemosynthetic, which means that um, are that they they, 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 they they form things from... Oh, sorry, let me take this from the beginning again. The mode of nutrition of sundew and bladder wort can be described as... Let me take it from the beginning. The mode of nutrition of sundew and bladder wort can be defined, can be described as a saprophytic, you know, that's to do with something decaying, Olozoic, those are things that swallow things or eat things, so to say. Mm. Chemosynthetic, it means they are forming their food from chemicals. Autotrophic means they can actually make their food by themselves. Now, let me say this. Sundew 
and bladder what are what we call carnivorous animals, which means they eat, they cause their living things, what's it called? The um uh, or they are prey to digest. It sounds funny. This when it's a, so a plant is carnivorous, it means it hunts or it kills, not really hunts. That's it. let me change that. It's not hunt, it kills animals basically. So when animals they have apparatus, let me show you. What I'm trying to say they have apparatus that makes them to digest and eat the organism. Like this, you are looking at is sundew. This sundew is going to wrap. It's going to you can see that it has sticky surface. So while the fly got to that place to probably I don't know what it feels it is was going to probably like plants like or uh, flies like sticky surfaces. So probably just landed on that and got stuck. And these are stinging cells, or sometimes even secret chemicals on the prey, and it's going to digest the prey. Now, we can't say this is chemosynthetic because it's not making this food from chemical, just like chemical, sulfur, methane, and all of those. No, those are chemosynthetic. This is, is working on organic molecule, organic living organism. So it is the answer here is going to be holozoic. It is digesting living things like it's eating it all right now this is bladder wort. this is found majorly in the um, aquatic region so sorry this here i'm trying to make sure it's now this flower that looks harmless actually as open as it, as it is when a fly or anything gets to that place this shot close and snaps close that way there's also venous fly trap that also kills um animals so to say now, bear this in mind, students often confuse carnivorous plants for parasitic plants. Parasitic plants are not killing animals, number one. Number two, they don't kill the, the host plants at once. For example, this is um, the other plant. This other plant is wrapped around the host plant. This is the host plant. Let me put the H on the host plant. This is the doda plant, this one here. Mm. As it's wrapped around, wrapped around that, it's going to suck the nutrients of this host plant because it has um, structures that's going to penetrate, penetrate through the, 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 the phlegm. And phlegm of plants is the structure that carries the uh, um, food, manufactured food, basically. So in no time, if it's not taken, this host plant will die out. So parasitic plants, example is do the plant like I mentioned now, and that is um, on plants. It doesn't kill the plant at once. But carnivorous plants are hunting. Let me sorry, I kept using the word hunting. Are killing animals. All right, so that is noted. Now, when a mixture of food substance and burning solution are, was one, the solution changed from blue to brick red this indicate the presence of what the process of reducing sugar now for a reason let me quickly explain some few things to you we have some type of sugar really we have the um reducing sugar and non-reducing sugar the reducing sugar refers to mostly the monosaccharide talking about glucose uh, fructose galactose also disaccharide like lactose and maltose however sucrose is also a disaccharide but it is not a reducing sugar. So this one here is a non-reducing sugar. All right. Now you may ask me what makes a reducing sugar is a reducing sugar is uh, a structure that has a free aldehyde or a free ketone group. Basically, that's what makes it a reducing sugar. It has a free aldehyde or ketone group. That's what makes a reducing sugar. And non-reducing sugar doesn't have a free that free aldehyde or um, reducing sugar. That's why it's the sucrose is called a non-reducing sugar because it doesn't have free aldehyde or ketone as it as it were. This is not a biochemistry class. I will have probably explain the difference between monosaccharide, polysaccharide, oligosaccharide, and disaccharide and all of those things. But I think I'll see mention make mention of some of this as we move on. But for the sake of remembrance, remember that uh, polysaccharide example includes those are the ones that have polymers of um, glucose. Example includes your um, starch, your glycogen in animals, your chitin, 
in insect arthropods, your cellulose also in plants, basically. Those are examples of polysaccharide. And the saccharide are just two sugar solution um, uh, molecules, sucrose, lactose, and maltose. All right. Why your monosaccharide remains the um, uh, glucose, well, fructose, and galactose, basically. All right. So now you might want to pause the video here to just see. I added this for a reason. Now, when we say it says here, looking at this, it says add Benedict solution. I'm sorry. I'm talking about this very region here. It says add Benedict solution to. The solution suspension to be tested heat for two minutes in a water in a water bath at boiling point and look at the change so what happens is it turns brick red with reducing sugar all right so it means that it is when it is reducing sugar that's what you see basically so you might want to pause the video here i deliberately added some of these things for you to have a better grasp of it pause the video here to see different food tests if i was going to do all of these ones it's going to take all of our time we have lectures for that separately now the primary structure responsible for pumping blood for circulation through the mammalian circulatory system is the left ventricle now i know we all know that is the heart but what part really does the real pumping it is the left ventricle now the right ventricle also pumps blood right but the right ventricle pumps blood for a short distance really just from the heart to the lungs but the left ventricle pumps blood around the whole body that's why it's even thicker so i have this here now looking at this here um uh, this let me see this i i, I normally like to just do some emphasis of emphasis on some things for you to remember now this is the left part of the heart this is the right part of the heart is unnoted now um this right side deals with the oxygenated blood while this left part deals with oxygenated blood basically now this lower part is the ventricles this upper part are the auricles now let me i hope you have taken note of those things i told you to get a pen and a buy and, and, and a book now the point is this to receives blood at the same time the blood is entering the right atrium or auricle by the inferior vena cava otherwise called posterior vena cava or post cava vein is the same thing this one is the superior vena cava that's bringing blood bringing the oxygenated blood and this one here is the left auricle or atrium bringing blood from the lungs for veins are going into it now bear in mind let me do this for the sake of um importance now this is receiving oxygenated blood from the lungs basically now bear in mind that this pulmonary vein vein this pulmonary vein is the only vein that carries the oxygenate sorry sorry oxygenated blood i take that again Pulmonary vein is the only way that carries oxygenated blood. While pulmonary artery are the only... Sorry, where is the artery? I'm trying to look for that. Okay. Artery... Oh, it's not labial, but this is it here. Pulmonary artery are the only artery... P artery... Are the only artery that carries the oxygenated blood. Let me take that again. Pulmonary vein is the only vein that carries oxygenated blood. Veins normally carry the oxygenated blood, but pulmonary vein is carrying blood that is rich in oxygen oxygenated blood arteries normally carry oxygenate oxygenated blood but pulmonary artery is carrying blood poor in oxygen which is called deoxygenated blood that is noted so it means that all this so uh this the, the left vein so the left auricle is is receiving blood from the lungs by four pulmonary veins i explained that because so you may wonder that why is it that it is vein that is bringing the ox bringing oxygenated blood that's because it's the only type of vein that does that all right hope that is clear and um i'm just trying to think of other things to say here so this is thicker part th thicker part and thickest part of the heart this part left um ventricle because it pumps blood 
that goes around the body through the systemic aorta that way all right while this one is also very interesting, but it's not as thick because it's taking blood to the lungs by pulmonary arteries all right pulmonary vein is bringing blood from the lungs and this one is taking the oxygenated blood while this one is bringing oxygenated blood you might rewind the video just to make this clear to you all right so we've said the answer to this is left ventricle now circulation of blood to all parts of the body except the lung is through systemic circulation systemic circulation systemic circulation now let me go back to okay i think i have this here wow what was that okay now basically here these that you're seeing i'm trying to get that part out yes this is pulmonary circuits that is from the left right ventricle to the lungs and from the lungs back to the right uh to the left atrium let me take it again let me put s here that's the start from the right ventricle to the lungs and from the lungs back to the left atrium or auricle that is the end of pulmonary circulation pulmonary circuit while the systemic circulation is from the left ventricle it goes around the whole body like that like that like that and comes back to the heart by the right auricle so it, it starts here it starts at the left ventricle and ends at the right auricle that's systemic circulation so you can see that what i just talked about now does not include the lungs so that's why we choose systemic circulation hope this is making sense now yeast to respire anaerobically to convert simple sugar to carbon dioxide and ethanol otherwise called um alcohol it means the same thing that's an respiration in yeast the sheet of muscle that separates the thoracic the thoracic, the thoracic and abdominal cavities is the now if you can see me clearly i'm not sure if you can see the from my neck to my waist is called trunk now all this part of me that is hard is called the thorax which english call, calls chest so this thorax, thoracic region, is um, the bony part of our body where we have the lungs and the, the heart. The two lungs are here. The heart is in between the two lungs. All right, just tilted towards the left a little. Now, inside, there's a sheet of muscle that separates. Like inside, I can't show you that. It's within me. All right, so that sheet of muscle is called diaphragm. And it's not just separating for separating sake. No, it is what helps us to breathe in. As I'm just breathing in now, that diaphragm was like this before I breathe in. So when I breathe in, it goes down like that. When you breathe out, it goes up like that. Do mm. I have a picture for that? Beautiful. So this is diaphragm. You can see that there. So when you inhale, it goes down. When you exhale, it goes up. Is that simple? If you see my lecture or respiratory system, you get to see what I'm saying the more. All right. Now, the oily substance that lubricates the mammalian hair to keep it flexible and water repellent is secreted by the what? When you look at the mammalian skin, which is the largest organ in the mammals, one single organ, that's the largest, is our skin, is the fact that it secretes oily substance which we call sebum. The name of the organ is, uh, of substance is called, that oil substance is called sebum. It's an oil substance. And it's secreted by the sebaceous gland. I think I have, um, let me show you that. So this is the um, sebaceous gland. Do I have that here? Yes, this is the sebaceous gland. That's one. That secretes oil onto the hair and also to the surface of the skin, really. That helps a lot, all right? That's what keeps our 
mm. my my face is oily even if i probably take my bath i didn't use any cream or anything after some time it, my face will become oily because we have more sebaceous gland on the skin because uh, on the what's it called on the skin of the face all right and then um, that's why when 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 somebody gets to puberty there's akin vulgaris we call pimples because due to testosterone in the male or estrogen in the female there's more secretion of this oily substance so because it is strange to your face at that point you find it a bit, a bit difficult for your for the face finding difficult to quickly get used to it so that's why you start having pimples we call it akin for some period and after some time it normalizes all right though it's not for everybody all right you probably get to see that in my um endocrine um lectures talking about hormones and all of that now the outer layer of the kidney where the bowman capsule are found is well uh if you can remember the diagram of the kidney it has the let me use the pen this is the kidney that's where i think you have to manage this very beautiful kidney from behind all right this outer part is called the cortex and this inner part is called the medulla so you have a very beautiful handwriting medulla now uh the bowman capsule is a uh, part of the nephron which is the basic unit of the kidney now most times uh let me show you this bowman capsule looks somewhat like that of the nephron i'm going to show you a picture of that a nephron goes like that this is very important for you to remember that orientation so the bowman capsule most times is found within the cortex i mean i'm not just giving an example that's how it is the bowman capsule of the nephron is within the thickness of the cortex while this uniferous tubule, this part which is made up of the um, proximal correlated tubule, loop of Hailey and all of that, is found within the medulla and this space called pelvis. All right, let me show you that the more. Now, this is what I'm trying to say here. So I need to re revise the nephron with you for within a minute here. This is a nephron, apparently. This part here is the what we call... Um, the Malpighian corpuscles or renal capsule, so to say. Now, let's stay with Malpighian corpuscles. Now, that is made up of, let me remove that right up there. It's made up of the Bowman capsule and the glomerulus, basically. I think I have another picture here. Yes. So, this tuft of capillaries is called glomerulus. So, the glomerulus and the Bowman capsule, which is this thing, that bracket kind of thing there, is what we call, uh, the two of them forms the Malpighian corpuscles, really, or some people, some people call it renal capsule, yes, renal capsule. Now, pay attention now. This part here, you can see, this is this thickness from here to here is the cortex. This is the medulla. So, this part, which is the, the question is saying, outer layer of the kidney where Bowman capsule is found is what the cortex so this is where the woman capsule is found all right why this other parts this other part is found in the medulla majorly so we have types of nephron anyways that what we call the um, um cortical nephron those cortical nephrons are the ones that almost all of their parts is found in the cortex while the juxta medullary um nephron are found between the cortex and the larger part is in the medulla all right that is what it means there but both of them can you see the abdomen capsule the abdomen capsule or you can say the amapigian corpuscles is found in the cortex again amapigian corpuscles made up of two things bowman capsule and glomerulus so that don't be confused so if i say amapigian corpuscles is the same thing because it contains bowman capsule all right which of the following stimuli is likely to elicit a nastic movement in an organism? All right. Nastic movement is a non-directional movement found majorly in plants. 
like we have a mimosa plant so it's going to be probably um um coming or uh, it could be light i'm coming wound lesion is out of it chemical substances no uh it, it can only be a light now when my light is this some plants like um i think four o'clock plants i'm trying to remember when it is daytime it opens when it is night it closes so it responds majorly to um nocturnal and diurnal nocturnal means at night so at night it closes and at during the day it opens up all right now another way to explain narcissism is as you have in a um, mimosa plant like this when it is um uh, uh, what's it called when you touch it the leaves closes up because it does that because uh, it's a way to protect itself from being eaten when the, the it closes up that way the animal feels that it doesn't look like if a plant wants to wait if an if an, if a herbivore wants to eat it once it sees that look it feels like this is not it this doesn't look like a plant anymore so it leaves it alone all right so it's one of the protective measures so aside this this is to touch this one is to touch but it's also to a light because we have types of nastic movements actually we have the one that has to do with this is torch really this other one has to do with light a response with um light now please i'm not talking about phototropism not that way phototropism is a directional response to light when you say phototropism is different please all right now in the male reproductive system of a mammal Spam is stored in the what? Well, let's be careful. Um, let me start from D. Let me analyze the answer here. Spam is made in the um, seminiferous tubule. It's made, it's made from the dead. So you can see spermatogenesis takes place in seminiferous tubule while it is stored in the epididymis and a little part of vas deferens but pay attention vas deferens otherwise called spam ducts is what transport the spam during ejaculation but sometimes you can have a little of this spam there but where it is stored is in the epididymis it is only formed so the answer to this is c it is formed let me take let, let, don't let me get you confused there it is formed here, spam is formed here, but stored here. So the answer is C. It is stored in the epididymis. Vas deferens is just going to convey it, transport it. Urethra is going to take it out of this of the, the, the body to the female productive tract. Alright. So this is what we're saying here. This epididymis where it is stored so semifrost tubule is within this test is where it is sectioned so when it is formed here it is stored in this epididymis here then when it is needed this is otherwise called spam duct don't forget that so it moves like that so the spam cell moves like that and when it gets to this prostate and bobo urethra gland seminal vesicle they add their fluid to it and become semen because your semen is formed by spam cell plus fluid from prostate gland seminal vesicle and let's say from the bobo urethra gland those are the things that form semen all right now chemosynthetic organisms are capable of manufacturing their food from simple inorganic substance through the process of oxidation yes nitrification is um a process by one of chemosynthetic organism which is a form of oxidation so but oxidation covers all of them put together all right now the part of the human gut that has acidic content is the i, I guess you pause the the question to try and attempt it is the stomach yes it has hcl and that's why it's capable of digesting what i guess you mentioned protein Protein is the food that can be digested in the stomach because protein prefers acidic medium as carbohydrate that prefers alkaline medium, which is why it can be digested in the mouth and other parts of the GI of the GI, which means gastrointestinal tract, the same thing as 
alimentary canal, the same thing as digestive system. All right, moving on. So this is what I was trying to say. So this is the stomach here. This is the stomach. Stomach, that's funny. This is the stomach there. So of course, this is the, okay, let me label this quickly. This is the liver. This is the pancreas. This is the duodenum. This is the gallbladder. This is the small intestine. This is the large intestine. This is the rectum. This is the cecum. C-E-A-C-U-M. Cecum. And this is the appendix. This is the esophagus. This should be... I'm not sure what that is, but this is salivary. All, all of this... All of these are salivary gland, salivary gland. This should be the pharynx. This is the tongue. This should be the pharynx. It's not so explicit enough. All right. Well, those are the, those structures. Uh, you need to know all of those things. That's your revising for jam. So you have to be remem remembering those things. If I were you, please pause the video, watch it and Try and learn those things. If it means write it down, if it means you rewind the video and you, you try to answer the questions before I start writing. All right. Now, stomata is to spirogyra, alveoli to earthworm, mapigian tubule to mammal, contactor vacuole to protozoa. Which are the fall? Which are the the above structures is correctly matched with the organism it is found. The answer is four, which is D. Coronal vacuole is used as excretory structure in protozoa. Mapigian tubule is used in insect or arthropods. Alveola is used in mammals. Stomata is used in plants, leaves of plants. So every all other ones were mismatched. All right. Now, the food chain always begins with what? With a producer. Where it's aquatic, as you have this aquatic or terrestrial, every food chain must start with a producer. It is a must. They are the ones that start the whole thing. So there is going to be C, producer. Well, whether primary producer or primary, uh, just producer for short. It's the same thing. Producer must, must be the beginning of every food chain. Now, mycorrhiza promotes plant growth by what? Now, listen. Mycorrhiza, excuse me, please. Myco has to do with fungi. Root has to do with, rice has to do with root. So it means mutualistic relationship between fungi and the root of plants. Fungi and root of plants. So mycorrhiza means fungi and root of plants. Now, how does it help them? It helps them by absorbing, let me see that. It says absorbing inorganic ions from the soil, protecting infection, helping to less absorb. No, the answer is A. So let me tell you what it means. Let me show you what it means. Now, let me show you that here. Yes. Look at this carefully, please. This is a plant without mycorrhiza. But this is one with mycorrhiza. No, so this mycorrhiza, the hyphae of the fungi there helps to serve to increase the surface area of the roots. So it means that this plant will be able to absorb more plant, more water and mineral salts than this other one here. So it helps them to be able to absorb faster. Let me show you another picture here. See it here too. Can you see the growth of A and B? This one doesn't have enough mycorrhiza with it. This one has more. So it means this is able to absorb more moist, more nutrients, more water as compared to B. So it is by absorbing organic areas from the soil. How? By increasing the surface area of the of the of the roots of the plants, so it's a mutual 
relationship, the plant is gaining by getting more nutrients faster, by absorb increasing absorption, and the 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 the, 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 the fungi is gaining because it gets protection and gets some nutrients also from the plants. All right, that's what, but however, it is not affecting the plants, and then in fact, it's helping the plants. All right, so when you enter, you hear the word myco, like mycology is the study of fungi. All right, now the barrier between maternal and fetal blood is the placenta. I think I have that here for you. So this is the um, placenta, like this. All right. So this is the maternal part, and this is the filter part of the placenta. So that's what that's the barrier that separates the two of them basically. All right. So all the nutrient from the mother goes from the mother to the baby through the umbilical cord, and all the waste products from the baby goes from the baby through the umbilical cord to the placenta, then to the mother's body. All right. Now the blood component that has the greatest affinity. For oxygen is the erythrocytes, which is the same thing as red blood cell. Leukocytes is white blood cell. Lymphocyte is a type of white blood cell. Thrombocytes are platelets for blood clotting. So it is erythrocyte, which is red blood cell that carries oxygen. Bear in mind, it doesn't carry oxygen alone. It also carries carbon dioxide too. Yes, when need be. Or I mean, it does that. It carries it too. Not when it carries it too, but we it carries oxygen more, really. All right. So this is the blood component. I want you to just remember that if you put your blood and you have it um, um, worked on, you put anticoagulant and you um, centrifuge it. What you have is this. You are going to have plasma. So plasma forms the highest parts like that 50 percent then your white blood cell and your platelets takes that these are called leukocytes and um, platelet which is thrombocyte then your red blood cell will settle down which is erythrocyte which is the same thing as red blood cell all right hope that is noted there now which of the following organism is mainly found in the marine habitat well at this point you might probably need to remember some things Acatina actually is some, um, I think that's land giant snail. Tilapia is found in fresh water. Tortoise is majorly found in, is it brackish or fresh water also? But dogfish is found at the base of the sea, and the sea is always uh, marine in nature. And that's like salty. So this is your dogfish, which is found at the base of the ocean. I mean, like a real deep sea. All right, so this, so this, your answer to this question is dogfish. All right, so the next question is, the two halves of the pelvic girdle are joined together at the pubic symphysis. Now, these actually are other parts of the, of the same bone. Obturator foramen is a hole through which vessels and nerves passes through. So this is what we're saying here. So this is the pubic symphysis there, down there. So it's joining these two halves with these two halves. So this obturator foramen is just actually a, a, a foramen which blood vessels, nerves, and all those passes through to go here and there. All right. So the answer to the question is obtur sorry, it's, um, sorry, it's pubic symphysis, which is option A. Adoption of um, appropriate nocturnal habits, burrowing, um, adjusting the internal temperature, possession of many pores. Which of the follow which of the above are the ways in which animals adapt to extreme heat of the environment? Well, um, they will act to have um, appropriate nocturnal habits. That means that most of them avoid coming out in the desert in the, during the day because by that way they will conserve um what's it called they won't lose heat so they don't come out during the day when the, the sun is very hot so most of them come out at now night burrowing also they try to stay in holes so that the sun doesn't get to heat them 
um, heat them up directly. Adjusting their body temperature, yes, probably vasodilation and um, the happening, reducing digestion and all of those things to reduce heat production, so to say. So from this option, I think possession of many sweat pores. Oh, excuse me. That doesn't look too very. That made sense, but um, we don't have that in our option. So I'm going to work with D. One, two, and three. All right. D looks like it really, but um, let me just work. I mean, I mean, um, four looks like it, but I'm not so sure. It made sense, but our option doesn't even have that in it. That means something position of any sweat pole doesn't look too right now um low anal rainfalls sparse vegetation high diurnal temperature and cold net are characteristics features of or that should be i'm coming higher diurnal temperature that should be of um Guinea savanna, basically. Yeah, it's going to be Guinea savanna. Low and all rainfalls, past vegetation. That's going to be Guinea savanna. Now, desert is too hot. He's saying here that you have sparse vegetation. That old desert's like you don't have anything there. Like that, that much. All right. Now, the activity of an organism which affects the survival of another organism in the same habitat constitutes organism of another organism that is biotic factor living thing affecting each other a daphic factor is soil a biotic factor means um the non-living things in the environment climate temperature air oxygen all of those things the average number of individual of a species per unit area of the habit habitat is the what population density so how do you calculate that? The answer is A, but I'm giving you the number of organism or per people divided by the area of that land or that place, so to say. All right, so the answer there is A. Now, the vector for yellow fever is, we have a lot of mosquitoes here. We have um, Aedes mosquito, Anopheles. Okay, then we have Cese fly. Then we have the black fly. Well, the answer is A. A this mosquito, Anopheles mosquito, is actually the one that, the one that transmits malaria. Now, be careful. Most of the malaria, sorry, most of the vector, sorry, most of the diseases that mosquitoes stand as vector for are transmitted by their female. Why? I'm telling you now emphatically that it is male mosquito, sorry, female mosquito that causes female anopheles. Female, remember to put that word, female anopheles, because it is only female mosquito that sucks blood. In case you don't know that, I'm saying this for emphasis sake now. It's only female mosquito that sucks blood to incubate their eggs because it's only female that ought to get pregnant. So, if you have an option that says male anopheles, female anopheles, generally anopheles, anopheles is wrong. But if you I can see female, the answer is female, the male eats plant juice. Even the female also eats plant juice. Mm. Let me go back a bit. What mosquitoes feed basically is from plants, plant juice and all of that. That's why you are asked to um, cut, you make your environment clean of um, plants and all of those things. So what do they eat? It is plant juice. Well, what do they use the blood for? To incubate their eggs. So while trying to um, suck the blood to incubate their eggs, because mammalian blood is hot, it's warm, they will release the pathogen. In the case of malaria, in the case of malaria, it's going to be plasmodium. In the case of... Um, um, or uh, other diseases, whatever the name of that pathogen was, will go in. So, in this case here, it's Aedes aegypti that causes 
yellow fever. You can see it. Aedes aegypti or the yellow fever mosquito. So the answer is A. A. Please do not forget that. And I'm never saying on the fact that it is female that does that. You can pause the video here to read other things I've written on the screen here for your consumption. These three right up here will help you. Now, the loss of soil through erosion can be reduced by watering, crop rotation, manuring, irrigation. Well, crop rotation can also help because um, shallow rooted crop, um, cover crop, so to say, I mean to say, cover crop helps. So when you plant cover crop this year, it's when rain falls, it doesn't allow the water to just flow easily. The probably next year, the next um, plot of land, so you're not just next, I mean, another plot of land you are using, let's say you have here, you have, uh, you plant a cover crop here, you have planted normal kind of plot crop here. So next year you move the cover crop here. So it, it prevents crop rotation. So it prevents um, soil erosion. All right. Now the protozoon plasmodium falciparum is transmitted by what? I love this question. Just what I told you. Female Anopheles mosquito, filming Aedes. The answer is filming Anopheles. And because Plasmodium falciparum is one of the species of Plasmodium that causes malaria. So the answer is Plasmodium. So it's female Anopheles mosquito. I told you that this one is for yellow fever. All right, that's, we saw that not quite long. So this is what we have here. So these are um, species of Aedes. This one I call this is yellow fever here. Then this is your Anopheles. Even though we are not so sure, sure that it's male or female, but the female so of course that carries Plasmodium falciparum basically. Now a daily solution of phenylthiocarbamide taste bitter to some people, and it's tasteless to some others. This is an example of what we call this continuous variation. So the variation is a variation whereby you either have it or you don't have it. It's either you have attached ear lobe or you don't have attached ear or lobe, so you can roll your tongue or not. But continuous variation has a midpoint. Is that you are um, fair, chocolate, dark. Or is that you are sh very short, medium height, or very tall. Those are examples of continuous variation. You have mid um mid um category so to say but for discontinuous is that you have that or you don't have that all right that's why we said for some people can taste to cover my family to cover my mind as being bitter that's rare some just most people taste it's tasteless in their mouth now thyroxine and adrenaline are examples of hormones which control what Thyroxine majorly controls metabolism and some sort of um, emotion, not emotion, behavior. If you don't have a balanced level of thyroxine, it can actually make you either too sluggish or too um, very active. And adrenaline, as we know, is, is um, a fight and flight hormone. So that's why it's going to be a behavioral pattern. Now, as a revision, where do we have adrenaline from? The thyroid gland that secretes thyroxine. So, where do we have thyroxine from? The, adre the thyrox thyro thyro thyroid gland, I mean to say, that secretes thyroxine. Like I told you, you can see thyroid gland here that secretes thyroxine. Then we have the adrenal gland, which is found in the adrenal gland, found where? On top of the kidney. Everywhere that has kidney has, on top of the those two kidneys, you have your. Um, adrenal gland there. A pair of genes that controls a trait is referred to as allele. So it could be, this is an allele, this is a pair of genes, so this is an allele, this is homozygous because the allele are identical, this is heterozygous, this is um, homozygous, this is heterozygous, just a pair of genes that is uh, alleles, so to say. All right, now moving on. The chromosome number of a cell before and after the process of meiosis is conventionally represented by, okay, that's gonna be 2N, 2N, that's D. When 
for example, in, in humans, you have 46 chromosomes in each of our cell. If our cell wants to develop by mitosis or meiosis of the two, it must have photocopy to form another, replicated to form another 46. Now, by meiosis, developed by meiosis, what happens? So at the level whereby it is 46 chromosomes, we call it 2N. Why? Because it has 1, 2, 3, yeah, 23 on this side, 3 on the other side, so it's, it's two copies, so it's, it's called 2N. 2N means when a cell has two copies of chromosomes. So this is a copy here, this is another copy here, a copy and another copy here, like in truth, like that. Now, so at this level, it is 2N. But before it's going to divide, it's going to make another 46. So that when it divides for the first time, now meiosis is in two stages. When it divides the first time, it gives us two daughter cells. One 46 goes here, another 46 comes here. Now, each of these cells will divide again. But this time around, it will not, the 46 will not double, it will not replicate. So it's going to be divided by to just 23 here, 23 here. 23 here, then another 23 here, just divided by 2. Now, when it was like this, this is what it looks like. This just looks like this. But when it became like these ones here, it's going to look like this. Just one set, not double. So this is 2n, this is n. So the answer is 2n. From having two copies to having just one copy. That's meiosis. But if it's mitosis, it's going to still be 2N because, like, if it's going to be mitosis, it's going to end here. So it is 46, 46 here. Because the same that was in the promos, the, the cell initially is what each of the other cell has. Don't forget this second 46 came because it just replicated itself before, before it started dividing. All right. Oh, sorry, I didn't even know I have that here. So you can pause the video here. So this is meiosis. So this is deployed. This is 2N. This is 2N. And this is N, 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 N. So this is for meiosis 1. And this is meiosis 2, so to say. That's just what I explained. So the answer is D once again. Now, at what stage? In the life history of a mammal, is the sex of an organism sex? Mm, of course, at conception. Now, why? This is an egg that has X chromosome all the time on the sex. The X chromosome is always the sex chromosome. But sperm cell can have X chromosome as its own. Um, sex chromosome can have Y as its um, sex chromosome in the karyotype or the number of chromosomes there. So if it's fertilized, if this egg is fertilized by, there's going to be XX, that's going to be XX, going to be a female. If it's fertilized by Y, it's going to be XY, which is going to be a male. So it is formed as conception. Conception is like just at fertilization, just after fertilization, that's conception. All right. The main distinguishing feature between the soldier termites and the member of the caste, or some call it caste, are the fact that presence of wings, possession of small head, no, absence of wings, possession of strong mandibles and large head. That's what makes a soldier termite. All right. Now, the flipper of a Will and the fins of a fish are example of what? Of uh, covagent evolution. Covagent evolution is when two different organisms has different ancestors now have the same structure that works similarly because of the same environment they live in. The whale, for example, and other fish both have something they can use to swim that looks alike because they both live in water. That's covagent evolution because two different Organisms that have different whale is a mammal, fishes are Pisces. So, but they have the same, they came from different ancestors, so to say. But because they live both live in water, they have the same, they develop, develop structure that have similar function. That's co -ev co evolution as it were. 
Now, if both parents are heterozygous for a trait, the probability that an offspring will be recessive for that trait is let's when you say something is heterozygous, you can choose any alphabet. So let's say I choose um A, A, this male heterozygous, the two alleles are not the same, two of them are heterozygous. Then if you cross it, it will be A A A A A A then A A. So this is homozygous, this is homozygous, homozygous, dominant, homozygous, recessive. Now this is heterozygous. You see how many of them will be um uh how many what's probability of, that will that we have that will recessive? How many so the probability that an offspring will be if both parents are heterozygous for a trait, probability that an offspring will be recessive for the trait, recessive for the trait. So how many of them have the recessiveness of the trait that is not showing? Is this two? Let's say this one is representing tallness, is representing let's say capital A is for tallness, let's say letter A is for shortness. So they have shortness in them, but it's not showing, but they have the trace recessive. It's gonna be that's one, two, three, four, it's gonna be two over four, which is gonna be one over two at the end of the day. That's A. Alright. Now use the diagram above to answer this question in which in which plantation are all the trees between the height of two to four meter? This is two. This is two. This is four. That's gonna be three. That's A. Alright. You want next one says use the diagram above to answer this. Question, which of the following is true feature of plantation two? Plantation two, this is plantation two. Okay, it is the highest number of trees above uh, of trees of, of about two meter high. Well, this is height here. Okay, it has the highest number of trees. Okay. Percentage of population. Well, okay. It has the the highest number of tall trees. The the height of all trees. It's three meter. It's trees ranges between two and six meter. This is out of it. It is the highest number of trees of about two millimeter high. That's correct. It has the highest number of trees. I'm trying to see that. That's the highest. A and B seems very confusing to me right now. It's the highest number of trees. No, no, no. The answer is B. It has the highest number of trees. Now, I chose this. Let me say it has the, it has the highest number of trees about two meter high. No, two meter high. Looking at this, look at the wideness of this. This is wider. But this is not so wide, it's just pointy. So it's just only a few of them are two meters there, but it has more number 20. So we'll go with A. Then I hope you understand what I just sorry. I we'll go with B. Sorry, it's B. The highest number of trees. The highest number of trees. Alright. Now, use the diagram above to answer this equation. The movement of materials. In the xylem and phlegm tissue of plant are represented by what? Xylem and phlegm. Xylem and phlegm. Xylem is the one that takes water and minerals off from the soil. That's going to be four. So that's four. 
and phlegm is one that takes food from the leaf. That's going to be three, which is this one. That's three. That's going to be three and four. Wait. Let me be sure this is well labeled out. Let me. Okay, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Is three and four. So the xylem is the four. This is xylem. While the phlegm, which is the one bringing this arrow, this arrow is three. That's three. That's three. Phlegm is three. So, wow, something is wrong in this. It's meant to be. Four and three, not three and four. I think there's a mistake here. So three is phlegm, and the person is saying xylem and phlegm, and we say xylem is four and phlegm is three. So it meant to be four and three. So the only close answer to that is A, but it's wrong because it's meant to be it's not three and four, it's meant to be four and three, considering the arrows. All right, so that took us longer than it should. Now, use the diagram above to answer this question. During photosynthesis, the arrow label to represent the two is oxygen being released by a sprite byproduct through the stomata. So, this is oxygen going out. If it to be one, one will be CO2 going in for photosynthesis. Now, use the diagram above to answer this question. The main function of the feathers covering the part label 2, 1. The part label, okay, this part is the feet. That's going to be down feathers. And the down feather helps to generate heat to keep the animal warm. So, part, this C flight is going to be quill feather. So it's going to be, the answer is B, to generate heat to keep the animal warm. All right. Now, use the diagram above to answer this question based on the shape and the structure of the beak and the feet. The bird represented is likely to feed on. Now, this is a hooked beak and the, the, the claws of the feet are also hooked. It's going to feed on flesh. It's going to be your, your eagle or the hawk, so to say. Now, use the diagram above to answer this question with respect to decreasing decadence in aquatic condition for reproduction. Now, that means that in, in when it's a decreasing decadence, sorry, decreasing dependence, decreasing dependence, meaning that, that they don't need water to reproduce on aquatic conditions for reproduction, which of the following is the correct arrangement of the animals? So that it, they are, I mean, based on the fact that they don't need water. So the first is going to be uh, mammals in aquatic, they don't need water to reproduce, followed by reptiles, followed by, so it's going to be one, mammals, reptile, two, uh, Then three is amphibia. Then four, just like one, two, three, four, the way it is. Do we have that here? This is a bit, let me be sure. Mammals, obviously, don't we don't depend on water. So it's a decrease dependence. Yes. So I think if it says increase, we'll have put fish as number one, but it says decrease dependence on aquatic condition. So it's going to be one. I'm very sure of this. Uh, the next one to eat is reptiles. Reptiles were the first to, to adapt to terrestrial habitats. It's going to be two. Then this is reptile. Reptile were the first to step, but they were normally to adapt totally. So they have to go back and shorten between water and land. It's going to be three. Then the last is going to be first. So it's like, as a move like this, 
you 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 need what you as more like this, you, you need water the more. So decreasing dependence on water. The answer should be this. But we don't have that in here. What we have here is It's one, two, four, and three. That's C. Yeah. Except they meant, except probably it meant the other way around. But when you say decrease dependence on aquatic condition, that means they don't need it. This is the real arrangement. It must have been a mistake in this. Uh, analyze it yourself and see what I've said, really. But if you understand the question, you'll be able to get if the answer to this area is correct or not. Now, the last question. In the diagram, which of the animals represent the oldest creature in terms of evolutionary history? Yes, of course. Uh, the first to step on land, sorry, amongst this, not to step on land, it's about water now, is going to be the fish, is going to be four, followed by amphibian followed by reptile, followed by mammal. So the oldest is going to be um, D. Well, this, if the question says, which of these is the, the um, latest to evolve? It's going to be one, which is the mammal. All right. Okay, and that will be all for